obviously it's been in existence for many years and the intent was workforce training and uh, in earlier years the, the marketplace for bringing companies into the state or helping them expand was a whole different ball game and the workforce development training fund was more beneficial truly as a training fund but as time evolved and companies started coming in and saying, what's your incentive package to even get us to talk to you, that Workforce Development Training Fund became uh, much more of an incentive fund than it had been historically. And there's a lot of money available, too. It's 3% of the unemployment taxes that are collected statewide. And when the unemployment tax rate was so high for a period of time there, the money that it was generating was actually more than what was necessary for incentivizing companies. So it, 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 the, the nature of how it was being used and, and the purpose seemed to change. And the emphasis wasn't quite so much on are we creating workforce versus how do we use this as an incentive to companies telling them that we can help them with their training needs by using these funds. Okay, so the circumstances that created the higher tax rate should not reoccur. There are two things going on. First of all, because of higher unemployment, the, the rate was being adjusted based on experience ratings. We had a pretty tough recession that we went through. And in addition, because of the way that, that the, uh, the trust fund was being maintained, they let it run too low. And even without that severe recession, they had run the money out of the, the state's unemployment trust fund, was essentially broke. So they had a double whammy of increasing the rate to compensate for the higher unemployment and to rebuild the fund. And so that's what pushed that rate up so high. I don't envision that rate ever going back to what it was. And if anything, we hope to see the rate continue to decline. I was actually more concerned about trying to convert the fund back to a training fund versus an incentive fund. That was more my focus. The things that were highlighted in that audit were important and that some will consider going forward because you're going to build more procedures around trying to make sure those things don't happen. But I consider that as something we could rectify in-house in more easily than trying to change the whole nature of what the fund's about. Well, it, it's actually changed because the, the uh, tax incentive fund that was set up through the Department of Commerce, which is passed as legislation, gave us a, the ability to move away from being so much of an incentive fund. We didn't have any other incentives for drawing businesses here, and so that's why everybody kept looking to the Workforce Development Training Fund to do it. With the new structure, we don't have that pressure on us anymore. Uh, the, the new incentive fund that Commerce put through and passed for, with an overwhelming percentage in both sides of the legislature should take care of that problem. So we don't have that artificial pressure to, to do more than what the fund was intended for. You know, it's hard for me to speak to the past. I know that going forward, there's, there's two things that come out of it. First of all, we're going to make sure that the money we spend, uh, we're going to be, the amount of money we spend per employee trained is going to be affected by how transferable those jobs are. That wasn't part of the, the metrics before. So we're actually determining how much we're willing to give to a company based on whether that, if that company succeeds or fails, those workers still are somebody qualified to go into the workforce somewhere else. So transferability of training is important to us. It's now uh, something that wasn't part of the calculations before. And quite honestly, we're never going to have a 100% success rate. Uh, if you look at the business failure rate for small to medium-sized businesses, it's pretty overwhelming. So even with the failures that we've had, the, the ratio compared to normal business failures is quite small. We're going to try and be more careful. We're going to do a lot of industry evaluation and analysis to make sure the industry makes sense, that so we're not just buying onto a glamour industry that says they want to come to Idaho. We're going to do more careful evaluation of that, but I never expect to have a 100% success rate with these companies. That's why it's going to be important to have those skills be transferable somewhere else if, that, if a company doesn't succeed. It actually doesn't work that way. It's surprisingly surprising how transferable skills are if they are if they're through a quality training approach. Most management can transfer between industries. Most of our our uh, skilled workforce running automated equipment, 
doing what it is, they're typically quite transferable. In fact, if anything, we've got shortages of those. Now, some of the companies that we're talking about that have not succeeded, uh, we needed those people. And uh, if anything, we should be doing a better job of making sure we grab them as quickly as possible and move them on to the next company. I have a very strong personal bias towards manufacturing. We're, and this is one of the things that surprised me coming into the Department of Labor. I quickly became aware of the fact that manufacturing is on a strong upswing in Idaho. And that, the multiplier effect for economic benefit coming out of manufacturing is much higher than other industries. So yeah, I've got a bias. We're going to be, uh, in fact, when we roll out the new program for public display on, on May 15th, we're going to be able to demonstrate that we are looking for structured training and it will favor companies that have a higher multiplier effect and manufacturing is the highest. You know, I haven't seen multi-billion dollar companies come to the table. Every one I've looked at has been really trying to make ends meet and make it work. So let's say we had an all state in Pocatello, which you've seen quite a bit of training funds. The, that is a, one of the larger companies that we've dealt with. And they were trying to create something unique and, and quite frankly with the training we provided them, it put them over the edge as to their willingness to come in and try something in Idaho that they might not have tried elsewhere. But the vast majority of these companies, even when you're talking about Chobani or a Cliff Bar, mm -hmm. they're, they're quite small in real terms. And Chobani has ex extreme competitive challenges uh, Cliff Bar has a lot of competitors coming online. These are big deals to them. They, these funds, even though they're small in terms of the total uh, economy out there, they're big to them in terms of their decision making as to whether to come here or not. So if you go back through the entire list, even when you talk of a Micron or somebody like that, in the grand scheme of things, those are relatively small companies that are doing everything they can to make it work. So I, I don't buy into this, well, we're, we're feeding the rich guy concept. I don't think that's what's going on here at all. Well, obviously, like I said, we're trying to focus on workforce training. We need to grow our economy, and it'll become more obvious as we move forward here that we have a workforce shortage. And we need to find a way to incentivize more training, better quality training. That's the goal of this fund. If you get into the argument of is this corporate welfare in general, uh, that's really not my call. That's a policy call made by the legislature. And in my discussions with them, I'm finding very strong support for continuing what we're doing because they think it's an essential part of, of growing Idaho. So I, I appreciate the fact that some people view it as corporate welfare, but that's not my position, and I don't think it's the position of our legislature. And as you know, our legislature is pretty conservative. Well, obviously, the biggest misconception is it's just corporate welfare, and it's going to people who don't need the money. Uh, that's not the case. But there are misconceptions as to how what benefit we're trying to derive from it. And that's why we, we do need to have better accountability. Uh, we haven't really been required to report to the legislature on the effectiveness of the fund or, or how we're using it. So going forward, we're going to have a lot greater accountability and transparency related to the fund. We hope to be each year be able to give a report to the legislature telling them exactly how it's being used, what benefits it's creating, and let them ask the questions you're asking. Well, there's several things, regardless of the rollout and the presentation on May 15th, and it's very logical. The fund historically had a certain number of thresholds before you could be considered. And then after that, it was what do you need in order to do the training you're talking about. It's more of requesting the company to describe the training and how much they thought they needed to do it. And on the tail end, they'd have to do some reporting. We're going to add several steps. We're going to keep those initial thresholds, but that is really a, a minimum threshold to get them in. After that, we'll have, uh, we'll have uh, the ability to calculate what they should receive per job created based on the wages that are paid, the, the type of training they're providing, the transferability of the jobs. It'll become a lot easier. In fact, we're, we're going to get it set up so the Department of Commerce can actually 
take somebody who's coming to the state saying, what incentives do you have? And they can walk them through and actually calculate what they might be able to receive if they meet all of the requirements. We're then also going to hit the report that came out in 2012, which was a one-time evaluation of how the fund is doing. We're going to build that type of, I'll call it audit procedures, into our fund going forward. So we're looking at each of our uh, contracts, auditing them to make sure that they're doing what they're telling us. And on top of that, we'll have the reporting to the legislature or other, or other entities after the fact. So we'll have four steps along the way versus two now that weren't necessarily uh, strong. We'll, we'll, make, we'll have all four components be strong, very visible. You'll be able to walk in, ask questions, get the answers you want. We've, we've laid it out for them, told them what we're doing. They all seem to be quite in favor of it. Uh, we, they actually haven't even asked us to tweak the things we're doing. They, they seem to be pretty strongly in favor of it. Some of the legislators that you cited in your previous articles, we've talked with them and told them what we're doing, and they seem to be uh, look at it very favorably, and they're, they're looking forward to seeing our reporting. We have to up the effective rate. It, that's, a, that's a given. Now, what we'll find when we first go in and start doing it, it's not an annual. It's going to be each contract. We'll go through and make sure that each contract. Okay. Uh, so and it'll come into an annual report, but it won't be an annual audit. We'll be actually looking at each contract, making sure that we understand what's going on, whether it's been effective. Yeah, we have to up that effective rate. And uh, we haven't set what we're targeting yet. We obviously would love to have it so that every job creates value, is transferable, et cetera. Uh, we still have to set those benchmarks up. We, but since the last one was actually only done in 12, we need to get up to speed and see where our problems are so we can come back and say, okay, based on the problems we're finding, these are the fixes that we're going to make so it doesn't happen again. Not worrisome. Uh, that's not the issue here. The question is we need to find some way to make sure that we know the impact. And if that means we have to ask the companies to provide different information or if we have to look at it a different way, we can get there. But it's just a matter of going through and, and, and working with it until we can get to the point where we're comfortable that we can do a proper evaluation of what's going on. Oh, boy. Is that too, too big of a venture? <laughs> uh, quite frankly, we are working so hard to update our systems internally for how we run as a department. I would love to say that that's the case. But that requires funding and a lot of things. The re information will be available, but to have it in a, in a readily available reporting format so somebody can go in and do data queries and things like that, yeah. If you can help fund that, we'll do it. <laughs> I wish I could. I really do, because that, be, that would be neat. Um, I think we've got everything we need. Is there anything else that we need to know about uh, May 15th, what's going to happen there, or about the fund in general? No, it's just a matter of uh, we need to use the fund the way it's intended. We've fortunately got other incentives that we can offer now, so we can go back and be able to, we're, we're going to see a lot more of our money not necessarily going directly to companies. They're going to go into industry sector grants where we work with the educational institutions trying to create programs that build pipelines of workforce versus responding on a reactionary basis to what companies need. So does that mean like like CSI, CWI, NIC, and Botech programs that, that they have might see some funding from the Workforce Development Fund? We hope so. We actually did that this last year. We had a million eight that went out that way. Uh, a lot of it was actually at a higher level. We're trying to create a computer science uh, pipeline that addresses our needs, and that went to Boise State.